There are over 50 million children in America, and our K-12 schools are charged with delivering academic knowledge to almost all of them. That's a huge task. The overwhelmingly dominant strategy is to dictate what needs to be known, then make everyone obey the system for delivering it. The political pendulum in K-12 schools is said to be perpetually swinging back and forth, but the pendulum is pivoting on the assumption that the key to learning is to obey. It is time for schools to purge the pendulum problem from their politics by making a different assumption about what causes learning. Previously in my video series Back to Basics 2.0, I explained that the central problem that plagues the K-12 system is massive disengagement. The disengagement problem calls for a moonshot challenge to flip the statistic from 70% of teachers and students disengaged to 70% or more engaged instead. My last video, Milking k 12 Sacred Cows, illuminated the three moral ideologies that dominate the landscape of schooling. They mess things up when they contradict each other. But if we can get them to work together, then improvement is inevitable. Now, in this video, I'm tackling instructional practice ideologies. The insight I will be sharing came to me while I was reading historian Larry Cuban's research into teaching practice. His book is called How Teachers Taught, Constancy and Change in American Classrooms, 1890-1990. In the book, Cuban shows that nothing new has arrived under the pedagogical sun in public schools for the last hundred years. The underlying ideas are all old hat. What has changed are the names they go by and the technologies for implementing them. Instructional practice in K-12 is thought to be swinging back and forth between being centered on either the student or the teacher. Student-centered practices are perennially on the leading edge of innovation because as Cuban's historical research revealed, despite a long history of existing, they are rarely implemented in more than a small fraction of schools, and even in those schools, it is often done very poorly. In the jargon of educational change, there's only marginal adoption and there is low fidelity to the original designs. This means that no matter how famous the innovators or their innovations, they've had very little effect on the system as a whole. Schools are still largely teacher-centric despite multiple waves of so-called progressive innovation. There have been a few cosmetic changes. Students' desks are no longer bolted to the floor. But the core of teaching is still teacher-centric in the majority of schools. Ironically, educational conservatives who champion the teacher-centric traditions seem to assume that when the system falls short, it must be because of how far progressive teachers have deviated from some imagined high point of rigorous, hardcore, teacher-centered instructional practices. They seem to figure that all those waves of progressivism must have corrupted teachers and their techniques to produce bad results. They propose that if students would just suck it up and be more obedient, then the school system would get better. On the other hand, the progressives recognize how deadly boring it is when students do not like, trust, or respect the teachers who routinely make them do academic activities. Academics are still the most important thing, but progressives want teachers and the school system to be more accommodating to what children are naturally like as immature human beings. Teachers should do more to treat children with respect, so they will obey more willingly. For over a hundred years, some version of these competing sentiments have been pushing schools back and forth. The results have consistently been academic improvements that are only marginal overall, and we have a huge disengagement problem affecting both teachers and students. What both sides have missed is the key to unlocking deeper learning. As long as we fail to properly understand deeper learning, Swinging back and forth between different versions of students obeying instructors can only get us marginal improvements. The disengagement problem will remain no matter which side takes this cake. We'll come back to this later. For now, there are three things that all education policy makers, both progressive and conservative, agree on, even though all three create problems. One, academics are everyone's first priority. See chapter four of my book to see why that's a problem. Number two, in order to be educated, 
the kids must be instructed. And as they are instructed, they're either learning or not. And three, as long as they are obeying their instructor, they are learning. One kind of obedience is sucking it up and regardless of your feelings, doing whatever your instructor tells you to do. Another kind involves having instructors who take the time to get to know you and to develop your trust in them so that you believe they truly have your best interests at heart. Either way, everyone agrees that disobedient misbehaviors indicate a lack of learning. However, what we have actually been learning from cognitive psychology since the 70s is that obedience has little to do with learning. There may be a coincidental correlation between them, but obedience does not cause learning. Learning is multidimensional, so putting learning into just one dimension, even if it was a good one, could screw up the decisions we make about how to run our schools. One basic fact that psychologists uncovered is that not learning only happens when you're asleep, sick, or dead. Since we rightly exclude sleeping, sickness, and death from the classroom, everyone who is in the classroom is learning. The relevant consideration is whether their learning is shallow or deep. Humans default to shallow learning, which is when we are only open to taking in information that fits with how we already understand things. Under the right circumstances, we can learn deeply. Learning deeply requires us to open our mind in a way that enables us to reorganize our understanding. In our complex globalized society today, learning deeply is crucial to being a good citizen. Depth of learning is affected by the structure of the situation. The quality of academic structures was quantified by the famous education researcher Benjamin Bloom in what he called the Two Sigma Challenge. He and his students found that one-on-one -on -one tutoring was a far more effective structure than the traditional practice of delivering lectures. They found that a set of techniques they called mastery learning was about halfway between the two, which led to a whole host of schools adopting the mastery method with mixed results. In the 60s and 70s, there were some famous efforts to entirely eliminate structure. Many of those experiments called themselves free schools, meaning free as in freedom, but nearly all of those schools failed and no longer exist. The few that survived still dismiss mandatory academic structures, but they survived because they figured out how to provide robust mandatory social structures. Part of the problem is that the deeper versus shallow dichotomy is still too simple to deal with the reality of fake learning. Fake learning or faux achievement is when students obediently jump through the hoops without mastering the material. This is a pervasive and underappreciated problem that affects 50 to 80% of all students and teachers according to research cited by Howard Gardner. The current mainstream of schooling does not yet know how to deal with the fact that some apparently good structures can still fail to produce the kind of deeper learning that is needed. The science of psychology can help us to be more realistic about this situation. We will maintain the notion of structure as a dimension with good structure on top and poor structure on the bottom of our continuum. Our second dimension is the quality of the experience that the learner is having. What we want to do is make sure that the students are having good experiences. They should have some enthusiasm for what they're doing. Moving away from the ideal, we can see that some students are in neutral. They may be bored, but in any case, their experience is neither good nor bad. At the other extreme is having a traumatic experience. It may be either a currently bad experience or it could be the memory of one. Regardless, bad experiences diminish the depth of learning. Here is our two-dimensional continuum for understanding learning. Let's go through the highlights of what this leads us to expect in terms of outcomes. First, we take the ideal of a good structure that is engaged with enthusiasm. The participants would find that their activities are personally challenging and they have access to a state of mind known as flow. The outcome of this combination is deeper learning. Next, we consider the other extreme. What 
can we expect to happen when there is poor structure with a lack of enthusiasm? That is when the activities are personally unchallenging or just irrelevant. That outcome is the same as when the structure is good, but there is still a lack of enthusiasm. Even though the structure of the learning activity is good, somehow the larger context in which the participant is situated cause, is causing some of his or her primary needs to be thwarted instead of supported. To learn more about the role of primary human needs, please watch my video series Back to Basics 2.0. What both of these combinations produce is shallow learning. In the final area, we consider what happens when you have enthusiasm, but the structure of the situation is poor. This happens when participants have goals, but the feedback from the situation is irrelevant to those goals. In my own schooling, this was a common pattern. In my book, More Joy, More Genius, I tell the story of how I was able to get decent grades from Mr. Schuster, my sophomore year high school math teacher. Despite the fact that when I took the assessments the next year, I failed them so completely that it was as if I had not taken Mr. Schuster's classes at all. So this continuum provides us with a pretty good account of the various types of outcomes that are commonly observed in schools today. The patterns of shallow and fake learning indicate disengagement while the pattern of deeper learning indicates the rare times when engagement prevails. The new idea here is to put attitude before academics in order to gain more reliable access to deeper learning. You will recall that I set out to deal with the political pendulum problem. Why is the pendulum such an unreliable means of improvement? I presume that the student-centered instructional ideology is concerned about the quality of experience dimension of our continuum. Improving the quality of experience is a good idea. The teacher-centered instructional ideology, on the other hand, is concerned with the structure dimension, also a good idea. But each side frames their enemies as perpetrators of a harmful status quo. They consistently mischaracterize what the other side is trying to achieve and end up alienating each other. Both sides are basically right to desire movement in the particular direction they champion, but the two dimensions have to work together. The alienation of the sides from each other makes it more likely that they will accomplish one or the other, but not both. Changing only a single dimension of the system at a time has gotten us only marginal improvements. If they achieve progress, it is too often only one direction in one dimension and may be undone by the next swing of the pendulum. What our education system needs is simultaneous progress in terms of both good structures and good experiences. And that is going to require more than mere obedience from teachers and students. It is going to require them to become more engaged in producing positive changes. Reading Cuban's historical perspective on K-12 public instruction has enabled me to realize that I'm for both sides of the K-12 political pendulum. But a pendulum can't be on both sides simultaneously, so it's time to purge the pendulum itself. Both sides are advocating for potentially valuable changes, but we have to frame our goals and policies for schools in appropriate ways that take advantage of the multidimensional reality of learning. My book, More Joy, More Genius, is about how to purge the pendulum to create systems-level change that will produce the kind of engagement that is needed. To find out more, visit my website, dladvocates.org. Thanks for watching.